Have you ever wondered about the dark side of drone technologies? Well, let me take you back to December 2018, to the week just before Christmas. Think brightly lit fern trees, streets crowded with shoppers, lights on every corner, and thousands of people packed into airports, waiting to fly off around the world to visit their loved ones. It was set to be the perfect Christmas. But for a small group of, say, 140,000 people or so, this was all about to change. In a field just outside Gatwick Airport, the UK's second largest airport, a drone was spotted high in the night sky. It was a security guard who spotted this drone. He was on his way home from work after a long nine-hour shift, and he caught, at the glimpse of the corner of his eye, the green and red flashing lights of the drone dancing about in the night sky, almost like it wanted to be seen. And then, as quickly as it appeared, it vanished. And it was from this point that the chaos began, and I became fascinated by this chaos, because I've been working on drones, drone technologies, drone warfare, drone conflict, everything drone for the last decade or so. I've advised NATO on terrorist drones, the UK Parliament on how to regulate rogue drone technologies. And so when the Gatwick debacle started to unfold, I was contacted by a number of media agencies to ask what exactly was going on and how we could stop this happening again in the future. So what actually happened at Gatwick on that fateful day in December 2018? Well, the confirmed report of one drone in the sky quickly turned into 92 different confirmed reports of drones flying around the airport. Industrial quality drones was the buzzword of the day. And what happened next was a game of cat and mouse, as the police were brought in to try and find out who was operating the drones and to bring the drone or many drones out of the sky. Astonishingly, this went on for the next 72 hours. And a thousand flights were diverted, delayed, or cancelled. But this was just the beginning, because over the next week or so, an uh, innocent couple, a man and a woman, in a town just up the road in Crawley, were arrested and then quickly released, but their names and their faces were plastered all over the national media. And the Prime Minister sent in the UK's high-tech counter-drone battlefield technologies to make sure that this wouldn't happen again. And people began to wonder, who was responsible for this? Was it the Russians causing their usual mischief? Was it terrorist infiltration? And one or two people said that actually, maybe it was just mass hysteria about the public panic about the drones themselves. Just a mirage in the sky based on anxiety. And the weird thing is, is that we still really don't know what happened or who was behind this deployment of these toy come potential weapons. And I suppose that's the point. That's what makes us fearful about drones. We don't know who's controlling them, and we don't know the intent behind them. They are ubiquitous. They can be above us, below us, or perilously outside of our aeroplane window as we land at an international airport. So we have a reason to be ever so slightly worried about drone systems. And if we look back through the recent history of rogue drone use, these worries become a little bit more justified and perhaps compounded. Let me take you back to the 1990s and to Japan, and specifically the terrorist doomsday death cult called Um Shirikyo. Now, the leader of this doomsday death cult was a guy called Asari, and he had a particular fascination with high technology. And as a result, early on in the 90s, he got hold of a small fleet of drones. 
and he fitted containers to them, but also ventilation fans. And the plan was simple. Fix them full of chemical agents and biological agents, send them high above the skies of Tokyo, and release mayhem, death, fear, and destruction as they went. Now, in the end, they went with a more low-tech option, and they released sarin gas on the Tokyo subway, killing 13 and tragically injuring 5,000. But the potential, the perils of the rogue drone were there to be seen. Now let's jump to 2015, but back in Japan. And this time, an environmental activist was so upset about the Japanese government's decision to reopen their nuclear reactors after the 2011 Fukushima earthquake that he went down to the beaches of Fukushima, got radioactive material and radioactive sand, put it into a container, then bought a drone off the internet, like any one of you could do, and then strapped that container to the bottom of the drone and then flew it high above the Japanese prime minister's house, landed it onto the roof, and left it radiating there for two weeks without anybody noticing. It was at this point one or two of us in the drone world looked up, so to speak, and thought there was one or two worries on the horizon. And then it wasn't long before ISIS got hold of these drone technologies, our worst fears coming true. Now, ISIS bought their drones off the internet, again, like any of us could do, but they were also supported by sympathizers back here in Europe, including here in Denmark. And in 2019, we had five people who have been prosecuted for supplying drone technologies to ISIS. And what they did was they took their pretty high-quality drones with 4K HD cameras, sent them high above the battlefield, and used them to direct their sniper fire and to position their vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices, their car bombs, to hit coalition forces. But this quickly progressed at a pace. Terrorists aren't stupid, and they were able to fix um, quite sophisticated improvised release devices onto their drones, and then put 40 millimeter mortars and grenades onto the bottom of them, and then send them out for as far as three kilometers, and then drop with pinpoint precision these missiles onto coalition and special forces, but also aid workers and civilians. And in fact, it was ISIS' success in this drone program that led them to put a threat across Europe, telling us all that European cities and our homes would be next. And in fact, it was off the back of this ISIS threat that a lot of the anxiety about drones in Europe and North America started to take hold. Now, it's important to note that there has not been a successful terrorist drone attack in Europe or North America yet. But there has been one or two worrying events. A couple of years ago, a uh, drunken drone hobbyist, a great combination, um, took his drone and flew it around the White House. A great idea. He then crashed that drone deep into the grounds of the White House. Now, this is one of the most protected buildings in the world, and it's quite worrying that a simple drone could violate that airspace, let alone get through deep into the grounds. And this hasn't been the only case. The Pentagon, just up the road, one of the most important military buildings in the United States, has, on no less than 100 occasions, had drones breach its airspace. The FBI have been swarmed by drones, police have been attacked by drones, and presidents in Venezuela have almost been assassinated by drones. So perhaps there are one or two reasons why we should be slightly hesitant about quickly welcoming these technologies into our lives. But there is some good news, and that is that counter-drone technologies are becoming increasingly sophisticated at a pace. Now, some of the technologies are a little bit odd, like the counter-drone eagles that are trained by the French and named after the Three Musketeers, because what else would you name them after? And they swoop in to take down drones if they're sent up at a music festival or at a sporting event. But on the other side of things, you have some really quite high-tech options as well. There's the drone gun, which is like a 
sci-fi slash Star Trekian phaser set from stun to kill to take drones out of the sky with high energy radio waves. There's also drone force fields and you can put disruptors around buildings that you don't want drones to go into and they will cancel the signal out to the drone. The US military have even developed their high intensity laser systems that they've put on their armored vehicles so they can literally melt drones out of the sky. So things are improving quite quickly and not before time because soon enough we will have thousands of drones flying above us on a daily basis. That may sound over the top, but big, massive online companies are already at the rollout stage for their delivery drone systems in places like Finland, where they're being tested. And soon enough, you will have large warehouses on the edge of cities that will have an endless march of drones going into our cities along our existing highways and our riverways and our train routes, flying above them, using these existing tributaries to get into our cities and deliver goods to us. And that's good, unless you like your countryside without swarming drones all over it. And in fact, no, it can be good, because we can have medicines, we can have bloods, we can have organs, defibrillators delivered to those people in need, and that can save lives. But there is a warning to be had as well. We need to learn the lessons from the mistakes of things like Gatwick, where we didn't heed the problems of the past and the warnings that were so obviously there. We need to keep the pressure on our governments and on industry and the security forces and the commercial actors to make sure the proper regulation is in place, but also the proper counter-drone technologies as well. Only by doing this can we harness the good of the drones, but whilst keeping us safe as well. So I suppose I'll leave you with one final thought. The next time you see a drone high in the sky, don't be too worried, but maybe have a second thought and a think about the kind of drone future that you want to see. Thank you. <laughs>